Ladies, gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, my name is Howard Anglin. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Constitution Foundation as of July 1st of last year. Uh, so, this, so this is actually my first Law and Freedom Conference and I'm very pleased to be here and I'm very pleased to see you all. Um, so thank you for joining us tonight, uh, this Friday night, for the kickoff event of our annual conference, a keynote address by Chief Justice Glenn Droyal of the Manitoba Court of Queen's Bench. Before I ask uh, Justice Lowers uh, to introduce Chief Justice Royal, I'd like to introduce the staff of the CCF, uh, I think most of whom or some of whom are in the room. If you could stand up, I see Adam in the back corner, if you put your hand up. Russell, put your hand up. Derek is sitting at the back there, and Joanna at the front. Uh, I encourage all of you who don't know them to get to know them this weekend. Uh, and more practically, these are probably the piece people you should talk to if you have any questions about the conference over the next few days. I'd like to provide a very brief uh, roundup. Everybody says very brief, and mine won't be quite as brief as I'd like, but I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, about the work that the CCF did over the last year that's kept us all busy. So in April, thanks to the stellar work of our pro bono counsel, uh, Ian Blue, Arnie Schweisberg and uh, Michael Bernard, and Ian is here tonight, um, who between them generously donated hundreds of hours of pro bono time, at least hundreds. Um, Mr. Gerard Como won an historic legal victory for interprovincial trade. If you don't remember this case, uh, Mr. Como was stopped and fined for buying beer and spirits in Quebec and driving it back to his home in New Brunswick. Uh, he was caught in a sting operation by the RCMP and fined just about, about $300. But unlike most people who just roll over in the face of a heavy-handed government, uh, Mr. Como pushed back. And with the help of, of Ian and the CCF, uh, he asserted his constitutional right to transport legally purchased goods across provincial lines. After a week-long trial, Judge LeBlanc of the provincial court agreed with Mr. Como and he ruled that New Brunswick's restrictions on the importation of alcohol from other provinces violate Section 121 of the Constitution Act of 1867, which is the provision that guarantees the free movement of goods between provinces. This decision reversed almost a century of bad Supreme Court precedent uh, that has hindered free interprovincial trade and uh, was contrary to the economic vision of the framers of the Constitution and our fathers of Confederation. For now, the decision's permanent impact remains to be seen, uh, particularly whether it will have any appeal outside of the jurisdiction of New Brunswick. On its merits, it obviously should, but you need the right cases to get it applied. Uh, fortunately, uh, just before Christmas, we got word that the New Brunswick Crown plans to, was planning to file for leave to the Supreme Court to have the case reviewed and their factum is due on January 16th, I believe, and then we have 60 days afterwards to respond to that. And this has breathed new life into this case. Uh, my main takeaway from the case, other than it was a fantastic decision, and I urge you all to read the 85-page decision of Judge LeBlanc, is that it gave, it gave some hope that when courts are presented with a clear and compelling case, that they can be persuaded to actually enforce the original meaning and intent of the Constitution and the freedoms it was designed to protect against, particularly against governments in this case, provincial governments who conspired for a long time to restrict, uh, restrict those rights and freedoms. The second case that stands out, in, not least because it's the largest and most complex and probably the most expensive case that the CCF has ever supported, is what has become known as the Canby Clinic case. This is a CCF-sponsored constitutional challenge in the, currently in the Supreme Court of British Columbia uh, by four patient plaintiffs and a private medical clinic, and they're challenging BC's restrictions on access to private medical treatment. After seven years of delays, seven years of delays by the government, this case finally went to trial on September 6th of this year. Originally scheduled for 24 weeks of courtroom time, and it's three weeks of courtroom time, one week off, so it's actually like seven or eight months. Ongoing obstructionist tactics by the government means that the case will probably run a good third longer than we anticipated. So we actually don't anticipate this case wrapping up till at least the summer of 2017. And you can imagine what the expense of keeping lawyers in court for eight or nine months with more than 100 witnesses, uh, hundreds of thousands of pages of documents. 
uh, what that entails. And slowly and surely, however, the, our council is managing to get the evidence we need into court. And we hope this evidence will support uh, our legal argument, which can be stated quite simply. And it's actually derived from the Shahuli decision about 11 years ago, the Supreme Court decision. And the case we are presenting here is that if the government is unable to provide timely medical treatment to all residents of a province, then it can't at the same time deny those people who are suffering on wait lists from taking control of their own health care and accessing or making private arrangements to be treated. It's a simple principle, as I say, it's grounded in the Chihuly decision, particularly the opinion of three justices, including the current Chief Justice, that the ongoing pain and suffering of people on wait lists uh, is a clear violation of their Section 7 rights to life, liberty, and security of the person. Win or lose at trial, we fully expect that this will at least be appealed to the BC uh, Court of Appeal and quite likely will end up in the Supreme Court of Canada in a few years down the road. And a victory there would be transformational. It would force our provincial governments to confront the serious and growing problems of unacceptable wait lists within our sclerotic public health care monopolies. And it would give Canadians the health care freedom and the choice that the citizens of every other developed country already have. The CCF also continues to support a host of other cases in which personal freedom is threatened or outright denied by abuses of state power, including civil forfeiture cases here in Ontario, which you'll hear about tomorrow on one of our panels, and recently a successful conclusion to a case involving the outrageous seizure of property from a sheep, sheep farmer also here in Ontario. Finally, with the generous support of Peter Monk and the Oreo Foundation, in 2016, the CCF launched the Runnymede Society uh, on law school campuses across the country. The name of the society, which I'm sure you can all guess, uh, was chosen to honor the field at Runnymede at which King John in 1215 signed the first uh, Magna Carta. There were, of course, many Magna Cartas, but the first Magna Carta. It was an act that signaled at least grudging official approval of many of the rights and freedoms that we enjoy in Canada today, including the rights to free speech, free assembly, and habeas corpus. Under the outstanding leadership of Director Joanna Barron, the Runnymede Society launched formally at the beginning of the school year with, and I always get this wrong, nine law school campus chapters, but it's also held events on several other campuses. And these events have included debates on topics as diverse as physician-assisted death, electoral reform, Trinity Western University's proposed law school, and whether human rights tribunals undermine free speech. Several chapters have also hosted talks by distinguished Canadian and American judges, uh, including I think at least one or two who are here tonight. Through these events, hundreds of law students have been exposed to views and discussions that unfortunately they're unlikely to hear in their classrooms today. I'm very pleased to have so many Runnymede Society presidents and members here joining us at the conference this year, and I would like to thank them for their work in ensuring that honest and vigorous debate and a commitment to free speech remain at the core of the Canadian law school experience. And now I'd like to invite Justice Peter Lowers of the Ontario Court of Appeal to introduce tonight's speaker. Justice Lowers, he corrected me a few weeks ago when I called him Mr. Justice Lowers. Apparently the Ontario Court of Appeal has dropped the use of gendered pronouns. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's an effect of being located too close to the University of Toronto. Uh, but I digress, we can have, get into that tomorrow. Uh, Justice Lowers received his Bachelor of Laws here at the University of Toronto and his Master of Laws down the road at Osgoode Hall. Before joining the bench, he had a distinguished career at a national law firm where his wide practice included civil litigation, constitutional law, human rights, administrative law, and it brought him before every level of court up to including the Supreme Court of Canada. In 2008, Justice Lowers was appointed to the Superior Court of Justice here in Ontario, and in 2012, he was appointed to the Court of Appeal. More than just being living proof that the government I worked for in Ottawa sometimes made good decisions, Justice Lowers is a model jurist and a gentleman. He embodies the judicial ideals of thoughtfulness, care, deep erudition worn lightly, humility, humor, and yes, humor is a core judicial virtue, and a relentless commitment to applying right reason honestly and consistently to the difficult and complex issues that come before the courts. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Justice Lowers. I'm uh, delighted to uh, be able to introduce to you tonight the Honorable Chief Justice Glenn Joal of the uh, Quebec, the Chief Justice of the Manitoba Court of Queen's Bench. And I am eagerly am anticipating his talk entitled The Charter and Canada's New Political Culture, uh, 
Are we all ambassadors now? Chief Justice uh, Joao was a Crown Attorney for many years as a practicing lawyer. He has served on every level of court in Manitoba. His experience is really unmatched by many, if any, other judges in Canada. But there is more to Chief Justice Joyal than uh, professional credentials. He is a true Renaissance man, having been prodigiously educated at such fine institutions as Oxford University, La Sorbonne, and Scuola Dante Alighieri in Florence, Italy. He has an avocation as a playwright. One play called De Lyon et les Pont, Leur Pont attracted a review which described it as a cleverly plotted a mischievously satirical look at some of the issues of cultural identity currently impacting Canadian society. While I am able to agree with the author of the review that Chief Justice Joyal brings to his life a leaven of wry, even sardonic humor, I am also pleased to say that none of his judgments could be described as a postmodern comedy of manners, <laughs> as, as the play was. You are in good hands with uh, Chief Justice Joyal this evening. Let me sound two uh, more serious notes. First, Chief Justice Joyal was Crown Counsel at the trial in Sauvé versus Canada. At issue was the constitutionality of legislation that prevented prisoners in federal penitentiaries from voting in federal elections. Ultimately, the Supreme Court of Canada struck it down in a split decision. The late Justice Charles Gauthier, in dissent, brought into focus the fraught relationship between legislatures and courts and nicely captured the trial crown's argument. Where this court is presented with competing social or political philosophies relating to the right to vote, it is not by merely approving or preferring one that the other is necessarily disproved or shown not to survive charter scrutiny. If social or political philosophy advanced by parliament reasonably justifies a limitation on the right in the context of a free and democratic society, then it ought to be upheld as constitutional. I conclude that this is so in the case at Barr. I can't think of a judge that uh, Chief Justice Joyal more resembles than, uh, than the late Charles Gauthier. A second more um, serious note, Chief Justice Joyal's master's thesis was entitled Traditional Canadian Political Culture, Adrift in the Era of the Charter. In his preface, he quoted Alexis de Tocqueville, who said, there is no country in the world in which everything can be provided for by the laws, or in which political institutions can prove a substitute for common sense and public morality. <clears throat> you can see that the themes of this evening have never been far from uh, Chief Justice Joyal's heart, Please join me in giving him a warm welcome and show him that we do not hold this Winnipeg weather against him. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Lowers. Let me say that if the adjective postmodern attaches to anything I say this evening, I've missed my mark. Uh, um, oh, the dissent of Justice Gonchi. Were it for the uh, I don't want to get started. That was a, a very difficult case, and that dissent represents in many ways, in many respects, the end of the normative um, period for the Supreme Court. Uh, we can get into that perhaps in some of the questions, but um, as you probably can guess, and I don't want to interrupt my speech, which is going to be long enough, but we're now grounded in an era where uh, empirical evidence is everything, and there's nothing wrong with empirical evidence. As they say, some of my best friends are empirical pieces of evidence. But for a constitutional, for a constitutional case to always be decided on the basis of empirical evidence, if that's where we're going, we are truly indeed into impoverished waters. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I feel very much tonight like the timid and shy church organist who on a rare Friday night gets to sneak out to a local smoky bar and play electric piano with a group of exciting but somewhat sub subversive jazz musicians. I say that because my talk this evening will not address many of the more mundane administrative or operational subjects about which a Chief Justice typically speaks out. Instead, my topic this evening, ladies and gentlemen, is a topic of a more foundational nature. 
touching what I'm going to say modestly are important subjects of public law. As you've heard from Justice Lauer, the title of my talk is The Charter in Canada's New Political Culture. Are we all ambassadors now? As the title might suggest, tonight I want to talk to you about Canada's current political culture, the Charter, and the somewhat uneasy and what I'm going to suggest is the uneven institutional relationship that exists as between the judiciary and the legislative branch. It is my contention that the new Canadian political culture has been both caused by and now very much reflects what has been over the last 35 years an increasing judicial dominance in the judicial legislative relationship. The subtextual and sometimes explicit question that I want to raise this evening is whether the state of that relationship should be so reflexively applauded and in different ways promoted. Regrettably, my position this evening will be advanced with all of the superficiality and conclusory reasoning that time requires and that judges generally abhor, but so be it. I'll feel more than satisfied if my remarks this evening provide any of you some source or reference for future reflection. So let's start with some context. You heard Justice Lauer speak about my master's thesis. It was many, many, many years ago in my misspent youth that I completed a master's thesis entitled Traditional Canadian Political Culture, Adrift in the Era of the Charter. Adrift as in floating somewhat aimlessly or with some uncertainty. That thesis was written in the comparatively early days of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Fast forward to the present day. 2017 and the current era of the Charter, Canadian political culture is no longer adrift. Canadian political culture, in my humble view, ladies and gentlemen, has now fundamentally changed. For those who are concerned about maintaining an, institu an institutional balance as between a strong and robust judiciary on the one hand, and an equally and purposeful, respected legislative branch on the other, this fundamental change in Canadian po pol political culture is not without consequence. This evening, I hope to explain why. Now, political culture is an extraordinarily useful and relevant concept, if not a bit slippery, especially for keen students like yourselves who are interested in the evolution of the Canadian Constitution or constitutional history more generally. So what is political culture? Well, broadly defined, a political culture reflects the attitudes and beliefs that citizens and its specific institutional actors hold about the political system. Political culture can also be seen as the conglomeration of ideas and values which set the parameters in which debate over policy justifications take place. Political culture shapes the perception of politically relevant problems and further affects what people perceive are the appropriate demarcation lines between government and institutional action. Tonight, I will suggest that Canada's new political culture is largely dominated by attitudes and beliefs now held by a broad, broad cross-section of the Canadian citizenry and its institutional actors, which attitudes and beliefs suggest an almost unconditional willingness to accept or endorse the idea of judicial adjudications in respect, of what are, in respect of what are often complex and even insoluble social and political problems. What were once political issues are now frequently transformed into legal issues. The transformation of political issues into legal issues often on the basis of new rights, has led to a new institutional dynamic as between the judiciary and legislative branch. Given the, the principle of constitutional supremacy, it is now an institutional relationship in which the legislative branch frequently occupies a diminished, if not, if not inferior role. It is the discussion surrounding this new institutional relationship and dynamic that often leads to those incendiary questions about the judicialization of politics and the politicization of the judiciary. While this new reality may be both a cause and now, as I say, a reflection of Canada's new political culture, it is for many who study Canadian history an unanticipated development that was not envisioned nor necessarily desired in 1982 the 1982 Compromise, as I'll, as I'll be calling it, 
that led to the adoption of the Charter. Indeed, as I will explain, the 1982 Compromise was in part a response to those who raised institutional concerns about an enhanced policy-making role for the judiciary under the Charter. Many, like constitutional scholar Peter Russell, feared that an enhanced judicial policy-making role would precipitate what he called a flight from politics. A flight from politics that Russell said would, quote, cause a deepening disillusionment with the procedures of representative government and government by discussion as a means of resolving fundamental questions of political justice. End quote. You'll hear more about the flight from politics later. I set out a few moments ago with a quixotic title of this evening's talk, The Charter in Canada's New Political Culture, Are We All Ambassadors Now? Now the somewhat incongruous reference, ladies and gentlemen, to the ambassadorial role comes from a speech recently given at the University of British Columbia by Canada's Attorney General and Minister of Justice, the Honorable Jody Wilson-Raybould. In a very genuine and earnest reference, Minister Wilson-Raybould explained to the students that she saw herself as being, quote, the ambassador for the Charter. It should be noted that the definition of the ambassadorial task includes the acts of promoting, championing, and protecting. With her reference to the ambassadorial role, the minister was perhaps spontaneously demonstrating, through her rhetorical enthusiasm, the very institutional and attitudinal changes that so reflect Canada's new political culture. The minister is hardly alone in her celebration of the Charter. To the contrary, most institutional actors in the Canadian polity seem similarly unconditional in their willingness to play a role championing and promoting the Charter. Whether one speaks of the legal profession, the legal academy, the opposition parties of the day, the citizenry, the media, and of course the judiciary, the spirit of Charter values has been enthusiastically adopted and endorsed. In other words, Charter values, whatever that means, is now not only an interpretive term of art emanating from Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence, it also now serves as a somewhat self-congratulatory reference point for defining the Canadian identity. An enthusiasm for the Charter, or as Professor Alan Cairns called it, a Charter patriotism, is on one level certainly understandable. The Charter is in many ways a unique and potentially nuanced constitutional instrument that in 1982 grew out of what Edmund Burke might have identified as the particular harmony and hidden wisdom of a nation's social and political history. There is much to admire in a document which provides important protections in relation to the areas of criminal justice, minority rights, group rights, equality, and of course the lines that demarcate the public and private spheres generally. Indeed, there is much to admire about the judiciary and how they've generally applied and enforced those rights. So put simply, as a foundational part of Canada's constitutional structure, the Charter deserves our respect and it requires our compliance. Yet to the extent that we as Canadian citizens and as institutional actors rarely raise questions about the resulting new and imbalanced relationship between the judiciary and the legislative branch, and to the extent that we rarely raise the connected questions about the broader implications for the Canadian polity, we risk a consequential intellectual complacency. In a political culture without such foundational questions being raised, it is not unreasonable to ask, I contend, whether, through complacency or by default, we are all ambassadors now. Tonight, in the face of what I'm somewhat facetiously saying are so many domestic Canadian ambassadors, I ask the question whether in Canada's new political culture there remains any intellectual space in which genuine concerns can be raised about a potential institutional imbalance that has and will continue to have implications for the Canadian polity. For the rest of my talk, I want to deal with the question I have raised by breaking it down and addressing two points. First, I wish to address in slightly more detail how Canadian political culture has changed, and in that context, why the somewhat uneven judicial-legislative relationship 
has to a significant degree contributed to that change. Second, I want to address the implications and consequences of this uneven institutional relationship as it relates to the broader Canadian polity. So let's start with what I allege is the change in Canadian political culture, a change that I also say is both caused by and reflects the current uneven institutional relationship between the judicial branch and the legislative branch. I think it's only fair that if one's going to describe a change, one must be able to point to what existed before the change. So let me just take a brief moment to describe, if I could, what I suggest was the traditional Canadian political culture in the years prior to the era that has followed the 1982 entrenchment of the Charter. I do with some, I want to do so with some humility as I have to acknowledge that the nature of Canada's political culture and the debates that surround it are always subject to some pretty wild and some pretty fierce discussion. But the degree to which liberal, collectivist, and communitarian values have been seen to dominate or share Canada's political culture really in the, de in the end depends upon the manner in which Canadian intellectual and ideological history has been interpreted. That debate in no way questions, however, and shouldn't cast into any doubt, what we all know has been the comparatively strong role of the legislative branch in Canadian history. Now, for some of the libertarians here, I may be treading on some fragile ground, but that is a fact, and, and, and I want to address that later on because it's something we have to grapple with, and it's not a bad thing, and it always boils down to the acceptable and legitimate demarcation lines of government action. But one thing we can say is that in Canada, there has always been, as I'll say, a purposeful role for the legislative branch. Canadian citizens have respected and deferred to the role of their federal and provincial governments to act in purposeful ways, irrespective of whether those governments were on the center, on the right, or on the left. That sort of purposeful governance was expected to include and achieve not only the realization of big and bold federal and provincial objectives, but as well the accommodation and brokering of the diverse and conflicting interests underlying the various societal ills and problems that regularly presented in a physically vast and a politically complex federation. This Canadian version of purposeful governance was inextricably tied to a concern for the larger community, a concern that cohered not to the American commitment to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but rather to what became the Canadian constitutional cliche of peace, order, and good government. Despite this obvious concern for the concept of broader national or provincial community and the purposeful role of the accompanying governments who nurtured it, it is my contention and the contention of many historians that prior to the era of the Charter, traditional Canadian political culture can be explained as having been shaped largely by attitudes which were consistent with and sympathetic to the core of the liberal ideal. Attitudes which convey a respect for the individual, and for liberty. Importantly, however, and it is important, there was at the same time in this Canadian political culture another very significant, idiosyncratic, and enduring quality. That endur enduring and idiosyncratic quality, ladies and gentlemen, related to the general degree to which Canadian political culture remained ideologically open. This ideological openness permitted a distinctly Canadian liberal and non-liberal value mix. Let me try to be more concrete. Some Canadian social historians believe, for example, that the Loyalist settlement was a formative event. It was an event that was part of a counter-revolution to the American Revolution. This counter-revolution created in Canada, they say, what some have called the Tory touch. This Tory touch implies that despite a dominant attachment to the ideal of individual liberty, Canada did, during its evolution, adopt from European conservatism a sensibility, a sensibility that tolerated a degree of state intervention in certain appropriate spheres of societal life. That Tory touch, along with subsequent phases of immigration that brought significant influences of European socialism, created in Canada an ideological diversity similar to European societies but one with a decidedly more liberal caste. This instinctively esteemed liberal element, tempered as it was with noteworthy strains of European conservatism and Toryism and socialism, 
enabled Canadian, Canadians to value their freedoms certainly as jealously as the Americans, but as well to point to important distinctions. These distinctions were based on and fostered by, amongst other things, the nature of Canadian legislation and the prevailing public discourse. Canadian legislation and its prevailing public discourse frequently reflected what I'm saying is the collectivist, communitarian aspects of Canada's incoming European ideologies. That legislation and political discourse, or public discourse, revealed as well an attitudinal tone, which in part shaped what Canadians thought about their political system and its institutions. So it's in the context of this traditional Canadian political culture, ladies and gentlemen, where the legislative branch was both highly respected and comparatively strong and bold, that Canada's less dominant but always present Tory and social democratic collectivist communitarian strains were so well served. At the risk of seeming to romanticize a golden age that never completely existed, I am going to nonetheless suggest that these less dominant ideological strains were well served in Canada by the coexisting processes of conciliation, compromise, and consensus. These processes were an integral part of the usually moderate ideological party positioning, which takes place in a liberal democracy where an elected parliament remains purposeful, accountable, and supreme. So if what I've just discussed constitutes more or less what had been prior to 1982 Canada's traditional political culture, how in the years following 1982 did this fundamental change? How did the fundamental change occur? More specifically, I ask you, why is it that we can say the political culture now, currently, both can be seen to have been caused by and reflects the change in the evolution of the judicial legislative relationship. It's my position, ladies and gentlemen, that any attempt to understand the nature and cause of the post-1982 changes in Canadian political culture begins with a recognition of what was the 1982 constitutional compromise, a recognition of what was a political compromise, and of course, the accompanying common understandings that made the adoption of the Charter possible. It's only by acknowledging some of those common understandings, I say, that one sees how the judicial branch has de-emphasized those understandings. By failing to more fully shape its role in light of those common understandings, the judiciary has created an unanticipated new relationship as between itself and the legislative branch. Time does not permit an adequate review of the history of the 1982 repatriation initiative, which ultimately led to the adoption of the Charter. It is enough to remember that the repatriation of the Constitution and the ultimate entrenchment of the Charter had been for some time prior to 1982 a goal of the federal government. The goal of entrenching a Charter was seen as a key ingredient in the federal government's nation-building strategy from approximately 1967 to 1982. This strategy coincided with what were admittedly certain emerging international trends in relation to the recognition of universal human rights, new norms of statehood, and more expansive notions of citizenship. Yet despite these trends, it should never be forgotten that in the context of the federal government's initiatives from 68 to 81, 82, most provincial governments to a greater or lesser degree opposed the adoption, of the, sort of char the, the adoption of the sort of charter that the federal government was proposing and had at its centerpiece of any patriation proposal that it had brought forward. Now, some of the provincial opposition was based on hesitation which arose from an intense loyalty to what was perceived as Canada's parliamentary tradition. The charter was seen by these opponents as an instrument which was, in their view, irreconcilable with the concept of legislative supremacy. These opponents were also mindful of, some of what, uh, mindful of what some uh, were quite worried about in the United States, the development of the constitutional law there and the relationship uh, in that context between the executive or legislative branches and the judiciary. There they pointed to the Bill of Rights as the culprit. 
However you analyze it, these premiers and their provincial officials were very concerned by what they had recently seen in the United States in terms of the manner of judicial interpretation and innovation which they believed served to circumvent the power of elected representatives. I'm now not just talking now about the premiers who we identify as being only two or three in 1981 and 82. I'm talking about the period leading up to 81 and 82. There was a provincial consensus in respect of that opposition, more or less. But it's important that you remember there was this opposition, because without that as a background, uh, one can easily be, uh, I think, misled about the consensus that existed with respect to what subsequently happened. In addition to the institutional or parliamentary purists, as I'll call them, those who feared the sort of innovation associated with the Supreme Court in the U.S., there were still other premiers who simply felt that, frankly, duly elected legislatures were as well positioned as anyone to protect individual rights and even community rights. So it's all, with all that opposition in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that the agreement ultimately reached by Pierre Elliott Trudeau and nine provinces in November of 1981 must be considered. And if you consider that context, you can't but be led inexorably to the conclusion that 1982, 1981 more precisely, was a negotiated accord. It was a settlement. It was a tough political compromise. As with any such agreement, it contains the results of a give and take, a give and take that was required to win over opposition. When one examines the nature of the negotiations and the tra trade-offs leading up to the agreement, it should be clear that the patriation package constitutes, as I just said, a tough political compromise with all of that, with everything that that implies. That compromise brokered, brokered in my view, certain common understandings, which, amongst other things, were able to assuage the concerns and interests of those on both the left and the right who worried about the loss of legislative supremacy and, frankly, worried about what they realized was going to be the inevitable new relationship. They realized this, but they worried nonetheless the inevitable new relationship between the judiciary and the legislative branch. The tough political compromise that was attained nonetheless succeeded, in my view, in mirroring much of the liberal and non-liberal value mix that had historically made up traditional Canadian political culture. The very inclusion of Section 1 and Section 3 represented an effort to find an acceptable balance between individual rights and majoritarian democracy. By its nature, the Compromise of 1982 envisioned through its included balancing mechanisms and terminology what the framers thought would now be, by necessity, a more nuanced but still balanced relationship as between the judiciary and the legislative branch. The essence of the 82 Compromise and some of the com accompanying common understandings, in my view, can be summarized as follows, and there are five of them. Common understanding number one. Concessions were made to both the communitarian and liberal elements as they found expression in both the individual rights guarantees and those provisions guaranteeing group rights. Common understanding number two. The compromise was based on a premise of positivism, grounded on a consensus as to the necessarily limited number of specifically enumerated individual and group rights identified. That is to say, there was an understanding that the legal protections would be those that were enacted by the framers. There was no suggested suggestion of hidden rights or principles that awaited discovery by the Promethean talents of the human mind or human reason. The drafters wanted the courts to be mindful of what rights were specifically prescribed and which were excluded. Common understanding number three. The specifically chosen phrase for section seven fundamental justice, was intended to be interpreted so as to limit the judiciary's review only to the procedural adequacy of legislation. The drafters and the framers of the Charter were not prepared to relinquish to the courts the right to question the substantive adequ adequacy of their legislation. They were not. In fact, no section caused the drafters more concern than what was to become Section 7. One of the drafters of the Charter was, at the time, Federal Assistant Deputy Minister of Public Law, Mr. Barry Strayer, QC, who, as you all know, went on to a distinguished judicial career, serving on both the Federal Trial Division and the Federal Court of Appeal. 
Mr. Strayer, as he then was, testified before a joint parliamentary committee about what was understood and intended by the drafters in respect of the phrase fundamental justice. Fearing the worst excesses of the American experience with the phrase due process of law, the drafters specifically chose the phrase fundamental justice, which was specifically meant not to go beyond procedural fairness. Put simply, ladies and gentlemen, and perhaps bluntly, the drafters wanted to avoid any language that would mandate substantive review and that would have the effect of permitting Section 7 to be interpreted to mean just about anything that could attract five votes on the Supreme Court of Canada. Common understanding number four. The inclusion of Section 1 expressly recognized that individual rights will sometimes yield to a broader collective good. Common understanding number five. The inclusion of Section 33, the notwithstanding clause, was meant to signal to the courts a caution, a caution in respect of any misconception that the judiciary might have, that they, the judiciary, were to give the absolutely most expansive scope to the enumerated charter rights. It is reasonable to assume that it was expected that the interpretation of those substantive charter rights would be restrained by and discerned with reference to the liberal, non-liberal value mix characteristic of Canada's political culture. And if one goes back to Big M Drug Mart and reads the judgment of Chief Justice Dixon, he talks, yes, about a liberal and generous interpretation of the substantive rights, but he also talks about the fact that those rights should not be overshot. They should be interpreted not in a vacuum, but mindful of the values that ground a document like the Charter. So those, ladies and gentlemen, are the five common understandings that I suggest most obviously ground the 1982 compromise, and I underscore compromise. Now whether one agrees or disagrees with the intellectual merits of the ideas or the motivations that underlie those common understandings, and that's often a debate that kind of sidetracks us, whether you agree or disagree with the ideas or motivations behind those common understandings, as facts they can be substantiated a priori or by the historical record. They do constitute the background and context for the 1982 compromise, a compromise that made the Charter possible. Accordingly, those common understandings, in my view, should now inform, at the very least, any study of Canada's constitutional history and the subsequent evolution of the judicial legislative relationship. The framers of the Charter would have been realistic enough to realize that the Charter did contain many, many open-ended provisions with undefined terminology, which would have to be eventually particularized by the courts. No one debates that. Nonetheless, it was thought, I contend, that the public debate of the day and the specifically limited number of purposely included rights would provide sufficient guideposts for a judiciary a judiciary that I would contend was expected in the years ahead to be more restrained than turned out to be the case. So if that was the nature of the 1982 compromise, a compromise that seemed to reflect in many respects the traditional liberal and non-liberal value mix, along with, and this is important, the desired institutional balance between the judiciary and the legislative branch, what happened? What happened in the following 35 years? Well, a few things, actually. While time does not permit a catalog review of the specific, relevant, and related cases, certain judicial approaches and analytical choices must be mentioned. Let's start with the judiciary's approach to the concept of justiciability, which expanded the breadth of issues and subjects that could now be dealt with by the courts. There was also the judiciary's new approach under the Charter to standing, which significantly relaxed previously existing rules, thereby permitting the participation of non-governmental interveners in charter litigation. Then there was, of course, the foundational interpretive approaches. In this regard, I note the elimination of the presumption of constitutionality, <clears throat> excuse me, the metaphor of the living tree. And as Justice David Stratus so rigorously identified last year in his keynote address, the Court's repeated use of the purpose of approach to interpret and expand in different cases substantive charter rights that had already been the subject of a purposeful analysis. 
Shasta Stratus's thesis last year on the purposeful pro purpose of approach for those who weren't here was if it's done once, if the purposes analysis is done once, completely and fully, for a particular right, there ought to be no need to go back and do it again. Going back and doing it again simply risks the possibility of finding a new angle, finding a new right, finding a new nuance that can fundamentally shift what that right is and render to the extent that we want and need predictability and, and, and consistency uh, almost uh, non-existent. But perhaps most faithfully as it relates to interpretive pro approaches and choices, I note the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in reference re, -motor re, -Brit reference re British Columbia Motor Vehicle Act. It was in that case that the court reasoned and determined that in relation to Section 7 of the Charter, the principles of fundamental justice need be interpreted substantively and not procedurally. In making that determination, Justice Lemaire specifically ignored the intention of those who so carefully crafted the language of Section 7 to not go beyond procedural protection. Justice Lemaire did so by determining that the evidence of those present at the creation, as it were, or those involved in the drafting, should be given minimal weight, since statements by civil servants were not sufficiently, sufficiently indicative of the intentions of the legislative bodies that adopted the Charter. It can be said that Justice Lemaire's fateful decision in motor vehicle branch reference has caused Section 7 in recent years certainly to be, I think, fairly characterized as the most fertile sort, source for the discovery of new rights and the de facto constitutionalization of political and social issues. Now, the resulting judicial incursion into subject areas and issues of profound political, moral, and social complexity has the potential of removing those issues from civic and political realms where I suggest ongoing and evolving debate and discussion may have taken place. As it relates to Section 1, it is worth noting that its impact on judicial power has been mitigated largely by the fact that, like every section in the Charter, the operational meaning of Section 1 was subject to judicial definition. The judiciary's formulation of the proportionality test under Section 1 somewhat incongruously places in the judiciary a discretionary role, more like a legislative committee. It's a discretionary position which, amongst other things, measures rationality, it assesses legislative means, and considers and balances the relative costs and benefits of national or provincial legislative regulation. Yet despite the structured nature of the discretion set out in the test, however it's changed from time to time, the proportionality test still places the judiciary, in my view, into a process of ad hoc interest balancing and cost-benefit analysis. For many, it's not obvious that the courts are always institutionally equipped to conduct that sort of traditionally legislative function. To the extent that the identified judicial approaches and accompanying reason may have been restrained by such things as the consistency and predictability that comes with precedent, or by such developments as, as the dialogue theory, those potential strengths had in their application sometimes uneven and ineffective influence. Precedent under the Charter, for example, has become less reliable as a source of consistent and stabilizing constitutional doctrine. This was never, never better illustrated than in certainly the recent Supreme Court of Canada judgments in Bedford and Carter. In those cases, the Supreme Court has all but invited trial judges to overturn Supreme Court of Canada decisions if and where an evidentiary record suggests that enough circumstances have changed. In the case of the dialogue theory, rather than offering the legislative branch a truly equal voice by way of its legislative responses, the theory proved to be more useful as a means by which the scope of Canadian judicial review could be legitimated. In the end, the so-called dialogue theory left little doubt about who alone could end the institutional conversation. It should be acknowledged that during this period, where the judiciary was opting to deploy the approaches and reasoning it did, the Canadian citizenry was becoming increasingly cynical and distrustful of their elected governments. In this context, governments quickly proved reluctant to use the, not with, to use the notwithstanding clause, which had 
largely become the constitutional equivalent of the nuclear option. It's important to recognize that, ladies and gentlemen, because it was an unhappy confluence of events. So that's what's happened since 1982. The interpretive approach is adopted and the analytical choices made by the judiciary throughout the 1980s and 90s, and indeed through to this day, have led without question to a level of judicial potency that was not anticipated back in 1982. As suggested, this new judicial potency involved an evolution which now carries on, concurrent with unfortunately the comparatively less respected and less celebrated standing of the legislative branch. Canadians more quickly than some have expected have accustomed themselves to the dispositions of societal problems by charter litigation and judicial adjudication. I suggested earlier that such a development was not without consequence for the Canadian polity. So what are those consequences? I see five. As you can tell, I have a sort of obsession with the number five. If this was, if this was a play, Justice Lowers, the director would cue the, the lights and ask for the mood sending somber dramatic music. But these consequences are, in my view, with, with, uh, with some significance. Consequence number one, the traditional role that the legislative branch played in the crafting of legislation, which reflected some combination of the main ideological strains of Canadian political history, is now increasingly more difficult. The now new and ever-expanding judicially inspired criteria for constitutionality is more and more difficult for the legislative branch to anticipate and indeed to meet. The sometimes technical and legalistic nature of such criteria does not always mesh or reconcile with the compromises or solutions that need regularly be made in the legislative form, where efforts are typically made to accommodate differing ideological positions. These compromises and solutions had historically helped shape a particular and distinctive Canadian identity. Consequence number two. In a political culture where its citizens and institutional actors have become undeniably comfortable with the Charter, with Charter litigation, and a judicial adjudication of political and social issues, there is now less room for long-term legislative results and solutions premised upon the tools of negotiation, persuasion, bargaining, and compromise. The development is significant, in my view, in a country like Canada where such legislative results could be seen historically as having been faithful to certain particular natural, national and cultural realities. Those decidedly non-legalistic compromises had, again in my view, worked to preserve shades of grey. Shades of grey that defined a diverse Canadian society, a complex federation, and a unique political culture. Consequence number three, with the expansion of judicial policymaking and the ability by individuals and groups to now make more stark claims on the state, there has indeed been a flight from politics. It is a flight from what is now a less potent and less influential legislative branch that seldom has the final word. This flight from politics towards the zero-sum game of charter litigation is shaped by a public discord, discourse that we all now know is dominated by the concept of rights. This flight from politics and the accompanying rights-inspired rights public discourse often leaves the broader citizenry on the sidelines. They're sitting on the sidelines in a potentially disempowered state, not, away, not always able to understand, discuss, debate, or grasp what are now the highly technical and legalistic formulations and tests, which more often than not form the basis of a final, final determination concerning a significant societal issue. Consequence number four. For both the broader citizenry and members of the legislative branch, there is, in the new Canadian political culture, a tendency to ground one's interests and rationalize one's own behavior on the basis of what is constitutional. In such a political culture, constitutionality 
may be conflated with wisdom. In the case of lawmakers, as former law dean and professor Prof. Douglas A. Schmeiser has noted, they, the lawmakers, may themselves become distracted from pursuing what should be their proper goal. According to Schmeiser, a legislator should be concerned primarily with the rightness of his or her legislation, not with its constitutionality. In connection to the sometimes reflexively invoked concept of constitutionality, governments may now be alternately more timid or opportunistic. The timidity and opportunism can manifest in the manner in which governments may take, delay, or avoid policy positions in the name of ensuring constitutionality. Consequence number five. With the constitutionality of more and more, with constitutionalizing of more and more political and social issues into fundamental rights, the Canadian judiciary has all but removed those issues in a fairly permanent way from the realm of future civic engagement and future political debate. Given the often invoked rationale underlying the use of the living tree metaphor, it is ironic indeed that in constitutionalizing these political and social issues, the courts have frozen those issues in time and thereby immunize those issues from future and involving civic engagement, discussion, and debate. In my view, ladies and gentlemen, those five consequences to the Canadian polit political culture, the polity more generally, are not insignificant. They all flow from what I suggest is now an uneasy and somewhat more imbalanced institutional relationship under the Charter. So I repeat the question with which I started my remarks. In the context of Canada's celebration of the Charter, should the state of the resulting judicial legislative relationship be so reflexively applauded and promoted? For those who find the intellectual space in Canada to ask that question, it may lead you to inquire as to how an institutional balance might be restored. To that question, I can only say the following. Any future restoration of a peculiarly Canadian institutional balance, as it relates to the judiciary and the legislative branch, if it is to take place, will have to occur in what is now a new and different Canadian political culture. Yet even if Canadians are now and will remain comfortable with, with their social and political problems being adjudicated via the Charter, I remain hopeful that my institution, the judiciary, will increasingly perform its task with the type of principled restraint, consistency, and predictability that can and should come from identifiable constitutional and legal doctrine. Part of my hopeful scenario would include Continuing, effort, continuing efforts at renewal of parliamentary and political institutions. The resulting enhanced public confidence would leave considerable room for a resuscitated and bold legislative branch to once again assertively shape attitudes and policies. This more assertive posture could include a parliament that would itself begin to play an increasingly coordinate role in articulating and promoting its own interpretation of the meaning of the Charter rights to life, liberty, and security of the person. I would hope and have every reason to believe that this would signal the beginning of a true dialogue, a true dialogue with the courts where the resulting policy would, I suspect, reflect a traditionally pragmatic and uniquely Canadian mix of liberal and non-liberal values. Those values had always infused into any conception of individual liberty an accompanying emphasis on the concept of a broader collective good. When I was at Oxford many years ago, they used to say that the definition of a good debate is one where no one opportunistically mentions Adolf Hitler. <laughs> In that spirit, I could, I suppose, say that a definition of a good Canadian speech is one where no one opportunistically invokes Canada's differences with the United States in a subtle claim to Canadian superiority. Alas, at the risk of doing just that, let me conclude by making the following and final point. Canadian attitudes and policies are currently in this, the year of the Charter, increasingly shaped by judicial formulations and tests 
many of, many of which find inspiration in a more absolutist notion of liberty. That less nuanced notion of liberty is more consistent with the ideological strains and doctrine that find their origins in the political culture of the United States of America. This more American liberal slash rationalist approach to rights protection gives expression to what used to be a very un-Canadian distrust of government. It's an approach to rights protection that removes more and more areas from certain legitimate and appropriate spheres of government action and influence. With this removal of issues from the appropriate spheres of government action and influence, there is a potentially impoverishing effect on traditional Canadian notions of the public and national good. This is especially so at a time when our laws are now increasingly shaped by a more narrow, legalistic, and rights-inspired concept of constitutionality. The theme of much of Canadian history has been the assertion and survival of a distinct Canadian identity in North America. It may be one of the most profound ironies of Pierre Trudeau's nation-building strategy of the 1980s that despite the celebration and promotion of the Charter, it has led to an institutional imbalance, one that dilutes, in my view, a fundamental source of Canadian distinctiveness. With the Americanization of important aspects of our Canadian constitutional system, the Canadian polity risks becoming less identifiably Canadian. Without a restoration of a more equal and nuanced judicial, institutional, judicial legislative institutional relationship, it remains uncertain, at least to me, as to whether there will be the type of nuance and balance envisioned by the framers at the 1982 Compromise. Yet, without such a balance, it is far from certain that the Canadian legislative branch will be in a position to do that which it has always done, maintain and nurture those distinguishing ideological traits that shape policies and solutions that have been so uniquely Canadian. So can the judicial legislative relationship be restored to a state of nuanced balance as envisioned by the framers in 1982? If it can, a necessary starting point for the realization of that objective will be the sort of inquiry that some might say I presumptu presumptu presumptuously have imposed upon you this evening. I thank you for your attention and your kind invitation. Uh, thank you for that very stimulating talk. Uh, if I understood your thesis correctly, you asserted that the constitutional order of 1982 was a, an exhaustive list of constitutionally enumerated rights and freedoms. Am I correct? I would say exhaustive. I, I, it, it was premised on positivism, so there was a clear sense of purpose that those that were those rights that were included, subject to some future particularization, were included for a specific reason. It's clear from the enumeration of what you see in there, and let's forget about for a moment section seven. It's clear from what you see in there, choices having having been made. So, uh, just to stop your first premise, it's exhaustive, but still room for, for particularization. So, the, the way I'll phrase my question is, how does section 26 fit into the constitutional order, the section that says that the guarantee of certain rights shouldn't be used or construed as denying the existence of other rights in Canada? Well, if, if you use section 26 in the way that you're suggesting it can be used, why, did you, why would you enumerate any, any rights at all? You could just simply use Section 26 as sort of the, the catch-all for anything, and all you would need was Section 1, maybe to constrain the, the, the wildness that would ensue. Um, the framers clearly enumerated certain rights with, I think, some, some sense of purpose. Um, there was obviously going to be some particularization of those rights. And that's why the purpose of approach is, I think, a perfectly acceptable and a perfectly uh, reasonable intellectual choice for the court to have made. Um, my concern, though, is the degree to which um, the choice uh, to enumerate the rights it did um, has nonetheless been, the choice by the framers, has nonetheless been sort of cast aside with a, with a certain casualness. And now the charter itself is seen as almost defective if some redress can't, can't be had. Uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but... Uh
Well, so, so what would be the correct interpretation of, of that section then? I'm, and in your in your uh, view of the charter, well, I don't think the section I, I don't think the section is meant to. Um, it, it's not meant as a springboard that would basically provide uh, an interpretive approach that allows the judiciary to do anything that would otherwise not be permitted because of a more restrictive approach to interpreting the 1982 compromise. It can't be that. Um, but I don't think so. As an interpretive instrument, I think you have to be pretty pretty modest about how you, how do you see it? It sounds to me very much like the Ninth Amendment uh, in, in the wording and the, uh, the, the, the purpose, if I can use that yeah. phrase, yeah. which in that case clearly means that uh, there are limitless rights and that the enumeration should not be used to, uh, to deny the existence of all the other rights that we haven't bothered listing. Yeah, I, 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 to the extent that, you know, that interpretation is meant to prevent an absurdity, which might be the, the, uh, the most strict reading of, of, of some of those rights, and there are those who believe that's how things ought to ensue. Um, I, I don't think in Canada that, that that danger ever existed, and I, and I don't think Section 26 has ever been invoked for that purpose. Uh, there's good reason you don't see that rationale being, uh, being utilized. Okay. Thank you. I thought I had a longer moment to catch my breath. Yeah. Take the pregnant pause, it's okay. Thank you for a terrific presentation. Uh, gosh, you paint with a broad brush. And, uh, That's the danger though, right? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> As you were talking and moving forward to the conclusion of your talks, I'm not, I haven't been a student of judicial behavior <clears throat> in enough detail. Uh, to understand whether or not the, and I'll use the, a loaded term, political correctness uh, being imposed on Canada's judiciary is a new phenomena. Uh, this morning in uh, Toronto's paper, The Globe and Mail, uh, there was an article, I mean, it was getting past the foolishness of the judge who apparently wore a Trump hat into a Canadian court the day after the U.S. election. And now he's being apparently censured for uh, making a political statement. So getting past the loadedness of the term political correctness, I'm wondering if a, a, a natural outcome of the trajectory that you've outlined isn't the imposition of a political standard on the judicial actors in our civil structure, civic structure. I mean, it's a, it's a good question, it's a difficult question, because let's not confuse what has to be um, a level of uh, judiciousness with um, what you might call a, uh, a, a threatening wind of political correctness. I mean, there's a, there's a good reason why the judiciary is expected to, to behave in certain ways that don't undermine the public confidence. I mean, we love, quite properly so, to invoke our judicial independence. Judicial independence, by definition, requires a level of public confidence, which in turn requires a level of judiciousness that allows the public to say, we're not acting just like the guy next door. Not that we're better or worse, but we're not acting with the casualness and with the potential um, uh, inanity that, uh, that would cause our office to diminish in standing. So um, I, I don't want you to extrapolate anything from my speech today uh, to suggest that there is a, uh, uh, an imminent uh, invasion of political correctness. I'll say this, though. Um, there is, and I touched upon it in my speech, there is a, a certain orthodoxy that is almost anti-intellectual um, in Canada that can sometimes exist so as to preempt the type of discussion that I'm trying to provoke today as it relates not to particular outcomes. I don't give a tinker's damn about how the Supreme Court or any other appellate court or trial division court decides a particular case. I'm interested in, in this instance, the institutional balance that I think was envisioned in 1982, and I'm interested in a certain rigor, a certain level of uh, uh, precision and predictability and consistency in terms of the judicial method. And to the extent that we've departed from that in our evolution that's changed our institution since 1982, that's not a good thing. 
Uh, it has implications for the political culture as well, and I touched upon that. But that's where really I'm maybe a little bit more exercised than the average bear. But it, it's not, a, um, it's not a, a rant or a clarion call against pr political correctness per se, but I do believe that there has to be a, uh, a greater engagement in these issues. And um, as I say, I have, um, uh, I have a lot of admiration for the Charter. I apply it, I interpret it, and I enforce it on a regular basis. But when you give a speech like this, you're very easily caricatured. Uh, people will say, hey, he's a Charter skeptic. Wrong. Ah, he's ranting as most people do in, 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 you know, in, a, in a yearly way, just so they get their requisite amount of flying time against judicial activism. Wrong. Nor am I complaining about a particular case or that. I'm talking about an institutional relationship that has to exist in a nuanced way, given, uh, given the nuanced mechanisms that, that were, uh, I think, set up in the 1982 uh, compromise. That's what I'm on about. But your balance, as you pointed out, takes place in a matrix. And that matrix includes, amongst other things, media scrutiny. And as I read that article this morning, I thought, poor sap of a judge in Hamilton, yeah. mm -hmm. 10, 20 years ago, would have never made the national press for an incident like that. The media would have, all of us would have brushed it off and trivialized it. Instead, it's highlighted as below the, below the fold, but front page news in, in quite graphic terms, all yeah. kinds of loaded language. That matrix then within which your balance is gonna take place uh, is different and changing and will involve more political standards applied to the judicial players in the piece. That's You're quite, look, I'm on the Judicial Conduct Committee of the Canadian Judicial Council, um, and I'm hearing cases all the time that involve, um, you know, alleged delicts on the part of a judge uh, in respect uh, of a behavior slash conduct. Um, Needless to say, um, the changing conditions and mores of our time can sometimes very much reflect what is permissible and what is not. Um, but that's the price one pays in becoming a judge. And I'm not trying to in any way um, minimize the concern you're raising, nor am I trying to impugn anybody about whom uh, you're talking. But, uh, you know, I, I don't have a difficulty with uh, with ascribing to judges a certain level of responsibility that they have to uh, live up to when, when it comes to the behavior. Thank you for a, a very illuminating talk. Um, given the five common understandings which you describe as having been prevalent in 1982, what could the framers have done differently so that those understandings would have, would have endured? I don't know. I, I, um, it's interesting that, you know, I was reading, um, you were Mr. Asher, is that a Honickman or Honickman? Uh, Honickman. We had a very interesting exchange with Leonid Sirota recently about Section 7. Um, you know, I, this isn't a case of, of, of making one's intentions more clear. Uh, I don't know too many people who've studied the historical record in relation to 1982 who don't more or less accept that there was this real concern, for example, about Section 7. Uh, so now we're getting into this debate about whether or not we should be opting for what the defenders of the current interpretation of Section 7 say would be a originalist approach to Section 7 if one places too much emphasis on what was in the minds of the drafters in 1982. The only thing I'd say to that is we're not talking about, in my view, a garden variety issue or provision in respect of the, you know, originalist discussion. We're talking about a fundamental approach that reflected the nature of a document that potentially, as we're seeing more and more now, less so in the early 80s and perhaps 90s, that section being used in a much more robust and aggressive way. And I, I don't know what could have been done to uh, mitigate the approach taken by Justice Lemaire. He had a very, you read his, his judgment, I, and he had his reasons. I, I, uh, you read them and you can, you can assess them. Um, he put them forward, but there was nothing that was ambiguous, um, in my view, about what was in the minds of the, the framers and the, the, the context of, of the time. 
he simply, uh, and I do take issue with one part of his judgment, and this is as, as bull as I'm going to get. When he said it can't be clear what was sort of you know, animating the drafters, I, I just don't accept that. Um, Barry Strayer uh, worked intimately on this file. He knew what was animating everybody. Um, he testified on a number of occasions about what was animating everybody. And if you want to use the other rationale that was used by Justice LeMaire, that's fine. But I, I don't think it's fair to say that a civil servant, a civil servant alone, couldn't adequately constitute the basis for knowing what was intended by Section 7. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Goyal, for that very intelli intellectually stimulating speech. I have a question for you because I'm uh, particularly interested in the uh, dialogue between the judiciary and the legislative uh, branch of um, government. I wonder, um, especially especially with what you said about how the judiciary is mo winning more of um, the dialogue than the um, legislature. And, um, I th uh, and as you has, have pointed out, um, that was demonstrated by the motor vehicle case, the Bedford to Carter case. And I think the same can be said about other countries, uh, both with the um, written and unwritten constitution. I wonder where you um, think this will lead to going forward, whether this trend will continue or whether something will be done on the political side. For example, whether the uh, legislature would in the future be more willing to use the notwithstanding clause if this goes too far, for example, and what your views towards the future would be in general. I don't know what's going to happen with the notwithstanding clause. I don't want to, I have to be, look at, I would love to share with you the dark corners of my, of my thoughts in terms of some of the prescriptions, but I, I, I can't. I'm a judge. I have obviously to, to uh, retain a neutrality going forward. Uh, if I'm sitting on a matter, I'm obviously going to be loyal to my judicial oath, but it, it's always more difficult when I, I've spoken out too starkly about what I think should happen. Um, I did say, however, that um, you know the legislative branch, hopefully with an enhanced standing that comes from parliamentary and institutional renewal, will be better placed to be more assertive. I did suggest that uh, we ought to be uh, seeing, you know, on the part of governments, a more active role um, in terms of the interpretation, articulation, and promotion of their discerning of a charter right. I think you may see that in Carter. That's as far as I want to go. Here you have a, uh, a federal government who admirably proceeded with what they thought was a legitimate piece of legislation after having obviously in their own mind circumscribed and discerned what they thought the charter right would say. Of course, you were hearing lots of academics already proclaiming the unconstitutionality of that legislation, but I think Parliament has a role in, 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 in doing what I referred to as coordinate uh, uh, interpretation. I think Dennis Baker, I don't know if he's here tonight, but he's written a, a, a wonderful book, Not Quite Supreme. Is he here tonight? Um, anyway, it's a, it's a very interesting book. I'm not suggesting that's the path going forward, but it is a way for government to get back in the game. And uh, once they become more assertive, once they become a little bit more bold, you may see something like what happened with Lincoln and Dred Scott. Um, and then you start to see a subtle shift in the relationship. And, and please, don't misunderstand me. Uh, I have friends in the judiciary. I have friends in the Supreme Court. I'm not suggesting there's some type of cabal or conspiracy. But there is now an inertia, at the very least, which is set in. And uh, unless there's discussion like the one I'm trying to provoke tonight, and unless there's, um, I think, a response from government in appropriate cases, um, this imbalance is going to continue, and as I say, the Canadian polity will be, will be more impoverished for it. Uh, thanks for the speech, uh, Chief Justice. I very much appreciated it. Uh, my question also relates to the relationship between courts and, and legislatures, and um, I think I agree in my own viewpoint is when I read Carter and I read Bedford, I, I personally feel they are 
a bit more activist than the decisions that preceded them, so the prostitution reference and Rodriguez. I'm just wondering your thoughts as to the argument that Parliament has an equal say, has had an equal say, and if anything, has the more supreme say. And uh, I say that because following uh, Bedford, the government of the day was able to implement legislation that, again, regulated sex work and whether those laws are constitutional are in question. Um, and following Carter, again, the government of the day um, is having a say on what physician-assisted death looks like. And so I'm wondering your thoughts on that argument that Parliament is speaking and, in fact, has the final say. Well, that's, that's a big question. I mean, that's the whole issue. De you know, Dennis Baker's thesis is that we're in a dichotomy where there's two theories. There's judicial supremacist or legislative supremacist. Typically right now, if you'd ask the average academic, they would say, no, no, we're into a state of affairs under this regime where constitu constitutional supremacy reigns, where the judiciary should have the last word. That's the legal academy. The most interesting analysis done, and I'm saying this to Professor McFarlane early on, is in the political sti studies departments, frankly. They're looking at things more inst institutionally and looking at, things, uh, looking at things a bit more broadly. Again, the legal academics are, are wonderful, interesting people. Some of them I know quite well, but a lot of them are, again, expressing a point of view from a certain orthodoxy. But Dennis Baker kind of breaks that, 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 that logjam with this interesting notion of coordinate interpretation. Uh, I, I wouldn't use the examples you, you, you've used as definitive examples of no, Parliament having the final word. I don't mean to paint them as no, such. No, 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 but let's wait and see. I mean, sure. uh, there's already cases in the system challenging, for example, the, uh, the assisted uh, dying legislation. Um, I mean, that's the nature of, of, of what happens. The question is, at the end of the day, who has the final word? And, and how do you as a government, if you want to, to sort of have some version of the final word, how do you ensure that in the public's mind, in a political culture right now where there's this increasing uh, customization and comfort with judicial constitutional uh, adjudications. How do you get to a point where you're able to convince you know, the, the, the broader citizenry that your interpretation of the substantive right, for example, as reflected in the legislation, is as worthy of consideration as the more sterile, constitutionalized interpretation, legalistic interpretation of the courts? That's the issue. I don't have an answer to that, but that's going to be the challenge for governments. Um, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it's played out. But they have to be more, um, you know, the, the, the Professor Gregor Weber is now with the, uh, the current government. It's a very interesting development that he took the job he did. I think he represents the type of guy who can bring a perspective, and I don't want to speak for him, I've never met him, but I have a certain admiration f uh, uh, about him from his writings. I think he can bring a perspective, the sort of which I'm talking about, and, uh, and, and bring government, I think, into a, into, a new, uh, into a new era where they're playing a, a form of coordinate role in the interpretation of the Charter. Like an Erwin Kotler uh, question in the House was always, <laughs> he'd get into the, going through the alphabet twice, he'd be part double Z. And, Mr. Uh, Speaker! Uh, yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, Charter values in passing. Right. And uh, I think that's one of the most interesting developments in the last, I don't know, when it started, last decade or so, <coughs> constitutional uh, discussion. Um, coming from the legislative side, it's one thing to start navigating constitutional rights and their unpredictability. But when you get into the more nebulous idea of con charter values, um, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure what they are, I'm not sure anybody's totally sure yet, to borrow a phrase from American jurisprudence, they penumbras formed by emanations of charter rights. Um, trying to measure the immeasurable with a rubber ruler. <laughs> yes. Uh, do you see that? Uh, the, the growth of ideas like charter values is being consistent with uh, this growing constitutionalization of our political discourse uh, more broadly and, and, uh, and where that could lead and how that could well, constrain to other, other actors, whether it's administrative bodies or legislatures. Well, it, it, it does very much represent um, something on the order of what I'll call the adjectival political 
um, development that I worry about. Political in the sense that charter values, and this wasn't the intention of the Supreme Court, that's not what I'm saying, but charter values is, is so self, so inherently, you know, uh, rife with the potential for promotion that um, anybody who, who wants to be on the right side of anything will invoke charter values. And again, that's a shortcut. It's an intellectual shortcut that leaves the citizenry in a position where, A, they won't understand what charter values means, by which they can assess what the proponent is suggesting is a good or bad thing. But it's also going to encourage them to, with some degree of, uh, of glibness, invoke charter values. Next thing you know, we're not talking about issues worthy of, uh, of defense, but we're talking about values. Values which can't be defined jurisprudentially and, frankly, can't be defined uh, in the uh, in the ordinary course of, of daily society. So to the extent that it represents one more departure, one more step away from what Justice Stratus so eloquently defined last year as the decline in legal doctrine, uh, it's lamentable.